Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. In the new children's history book by Sharon Elizabeth Sexton, the story is told of an eight-year-old black child growing up during the early 60s in Detroit. The book's titled MLK Jr.'s Detroit Dream, Memoir of a Civil Rights Foot Soldier, and I get to find out more about this really interesting book. The author, Sharon, is here with me now. Sharon, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. I appreciate you being here with me. Well, thank you, and thank you for thinking that this is a book worthy enough to be talked about. Absolutely. I love the message and the story told here, Sharon. Can you tell me what readers can find in there? The book is a history book. It's a five-year history book between 1963 and 1968. And basically, I am the, the foot soldier, the civil rights foot soldier, if you couldn't, couldn't tell. And it starts with my dad tricking me by saying we are going to a parade. And it ended up being when Martin Luther King came to Detroit and marched down Woodward Avenue and gave the first version of his I Have a Dream speech. Oh, wow. So, Sharon, what was the inspiration for you to write this? Well, actually, I had two inspirations. One, a couple of years ago, I went to a MLK Day activity, and the main speaker ended up not being able to come because she got sick. And when I was looking at the children, they were getting all bored, you know, squirming around in their chairs. So for whatever reason, you know, I guess God spoke to me or it just hit me. Go out and tell the story about when you first saw Martin Luther King. Now, mind you, I've never met him. So I went out and I started telling the story about my dad tricking me. And we went downtown in Detroit that day. And it was the most people I had ever seen. Mm. And then, you know, we were standing in the crowd, and I couldn't see anything because I was only eight years old. <laughs> and then my mom said, well, here he comes. And then my dad lifted me up on his shoulders, which was unusual because, you know, I hadn't been on his shoulders since I was like three, four years old. <laughs> and, you know, I was just awed that this man was walking down the street. And I knew a little bit about him because I did watch the news as a young person. So I knew that there was some issues going on down south and that he was trying to address some of these issues dealing with black people in the south. And I knew I was black. And so we had to stand outside. And they had these speakers because the unions had sponsored the march. They had these huge speakers. And that's how I heard the I Have a Dream speech for the first time, standing on the street, you know, listening to this great booming voice. I was telling that to the kids, and they were just enthralled, and we were all <laughs> marching through the museum, the historical museum here, singing, We Shall Overcome. And these are, you know, like four- and five-year-old little white kids. <laughs> it's like, hey, they really got into this story. Maybe I have something here. Hmm. Sharon, how long did this take you to write and then get published? It took, I would say, a year and a half. It only took maybe about a few months to a half a year to write because I kept adding, you know, as, as I was remembering, because like I said, this was a five-year time between when I was eight years old and 13. Mm. And there was a lot that happened in that time period. I didn't even realize how much had happened until I started trying to remember back on it. You know, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Malcolm X was assassinated. They had Muhammad Ali, who started off as Cassius Clay. You had James Brown singing, I'm black and I'm proud. And even here in Detroit, there were some issues going on. Yeah, we always think of the cross burning going on in the South. Well, when I was eight years old, there was a cross burned on the lawn right across the street from me. Mm -hmm. So my book doesn't get into why necessarily things happen. It's just that as a kid, you observe all these things and you just notice them. It's like, dang, you might think about them. So, you know, the book goes very quickly. It's 28 pages, and a good reader can read it within a half an hour. And like I said, it takes you through five years of Black history, or really American history. I know children and readers alike are really going to love this book and get a lot out of this story. Again, the title is 
MLK Jr.'s Detroit Dream, Memoir of a Civil Rights Foot Soldier. This is written by Sharon Elizabeth Sexton. It's published by Newman Springs Publishing, so you can find it everywhere like Amazon and Barnes & Noble and iTunes, traditional brick-and-mortar stores, anywhere you go to pick up your books. Well, Sharon, thank you again for joining me tonight and telling me all about this really fascinating book. I had a nice time talking with you. Well, thank you for inviting me, and thank your listeners for listening to my story. The Impromptu Heroes. It's the new book by David Hawk, and it's a thrilling tale of survival and heroism in the face of danger. The audiobook edition is out now, and I'm talking all about it with the author, David, here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. David, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Can you tell me what readers will find when they open up the Impromptu Heroes? Well, I think they'll find a young couple that is on a peaceful trip in a little quiet country. And while they're there, it's overrun by rebel forces that are working for a South American drug cartel. And they try to stay clear, but they end up getting in trouble and they're getting in the middle of it. And they end up getting in about as deep as you can get with them and the group they're with. And they really end up getting in a lot of trouble and have to start doing things they never thought they'd have to do. Now, David, what sort of a readership, a target audience, do you think would be really into this? I think anyone that really likes a good adventure and the twists and turns that go with the story, because you really won't know how it ends up till the very end. I think that they would enjoy it the most. I bet anybody can read it. It's not a real long book, but it is long enough to keep you entertained for a while. Hmm. So, David, how did this book come into being? What gave you the idea or the inspiration for it? Well, it just sort of got into my head one time, this thought of this plot that I've got going that's in the book. And I just started writing it down and putting it into words. And suddenly I realized I really thought I had something. And I turned it into a book and wrote the complete book out. It was really just all started up by a thought one day when it just sort of came to my head. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, this is your first book, correct? Yes, it is. been a great experience. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations. How long did this take you to do all together, the writing and publishing? Well, it was probably about a two-year effort. It took a little over a year for as far as the writing the book, and I got it edited and enhanced it a few places before I got it ready for the publisher. And it took a good year or so I talked to the publisher before we actually got it out on the market. And it must have been a really great day whenever your first copy came in. You got to see your book, hold your book, and there's your name on the cover. What was that like? Oh, it was awesome. I really can't put it into words. I looked down in the box and I pulled the book out and, you know, here's my writing. It went from being words on a computer screen to actual book. And, you know, my name's on the front and it has weight. I mean, it was very emotional, to say the least. David, do you think you have more books in you or do you think about writing more in the future? Oh, yeah. I've got another one written now. I'm kind of putting the finishing touches on it. Not quite ready to get it published, but it, hopefully it won't be too long. i am also started, just recently started a book that's kind of going to be a sequel to this book here, The Impromptu Heroes, but it's kind of in the beginning of things. And I've got some other ideas banging around in my head that I want to try to get on paper. Now, David, you're a published author now. For you, what's the most rewarding aspect of that? I think knowing that someone can actually take this book and read it or listen to it, of course, and escape the real world for a while, like roughly eight hours or so, and hopefully just lighten the burden of their life. And people that don't know me are going to be reading and listening to this. That's probably what gives me the most satisfaction. That other people will be able to enjoy what I've written. And we are talking about the audiobook edition, of course. David, what was it like whenever you heard your book as opposed to reading it like you were used to? Uh, it, it is. It, I'll have to admit it's quite a bit different because you kind of read it and you kind of put it into your head the way it is. And when I heard it read, it was a completely different, you know, angle of hearing it. And it was good. I, I enjoyed it when I someone else was actually reading it, you know, other than me. It was really great hearing them the way they interpreted it. I, I was really happy when I heard that. Mm. Was it difficult finding just that right voice for your book? There were several people that auditioned for it and they were all good. But then I just chose one that I thought was probably the best, and it, it worked out real well. I'm real happy with the way it sounds. You've done a great job. Do you have any advice now that you could offer to aspiring authors? Yes. I'd say don't give up. If you think you do want to write, write. Don't hesitate because life's too short. 
I put it off longer than I wanted to. I always have written things, but it'd be nice if I could have done this a little bit sooner in life. But if you think you might want to do it, do it and don't put it off. Good advice. I think there are a lot of readers and listeners out there to the audiobook that are going to love this. Again, it's called The Impromptu Heroes. It's written by David Hawk, published by the Audiobook Network. So go anywhere where you go to pick up your audiobooks, like Audible or iTunes or Amazon. David, thanks again for coming on the show and telling me all about the impromptu heroes and your whole process and everything. It was really nice talking tonight. It was really great talking to you, and I appreciate it very much. This book invites you to break free from the endless pursuit of physical beauty, revealing God's deeper definition of beauty and our purpose in His creation. This is a book written by Kimberly Stork, and it's called Chasing Beautiful a Bible study on faith, fitness, and physical appearance. And I get to talk all about this book now. Kim is here with me at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Kim, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Kim, can you tell me all about Chasing Beautiful? What can readers find here? Absolutely. I would love to. Well, Chasing Beautiful is designed as a six-week Bible study with five days of work each week. In the first week, we explore how and when our own concepts of beauty developed, as well as how they're interwoven in the fabric of our lives. And then in week two, we're going to begin researching what God says about beauty in the Bible, what is our full identity in Christ in the third week. In the fourth week, we're going to talk about how Satan attacks us in this area. Fifthly, what it really means to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, in week six, what to do when we struggle. And you're primarily speaking to women here, correct? Primarily. I have heard from quite a number of men, actually, that they would find uh, this book of interest to them as well. But I have found that women, you know, men usually, they struggle more with power and, you know, status and things like that. Mm. You know, not not to draw lines in the sand there, of course. But women just seem to have this innate and natural just yearning to be found beautiful. It really seems like God placed it there when he made us. Now, Kim, how were you inspired to write this book? What gave you the idea? Well, it really was the Holy Spirit who prompted me to write this study. I was actually doing yoga at home a few years ago when I felt the Holy Spirit whisper to my spirit, what if you wrote a Bible study? To which I replied, respectfully, sir, I think you've got the wrong girl. I'm no (laughs) author. I was a personal trainer and gym owner at the time. So that was not in my wheelhouse yet. Um, But, you know, his reply was, well, just tell them everything that I've been teaching you. And so that's exactly what I did. So it's very much Holy Spirit prompted, God led, but largely based on my own experience, as well as, of course, that of the hundreds of women I've trained and counseled at my gym, who no matter how much weight they lost, muscle they gained, goals they reached or surpassed, like most of us, they never felt like they were enough. Once you sat down, started writing this, Kim, how long of a process was it for you clear up until it was published? Yeah, it's been about two years now. The initial writing took me about four months, but you got to keep in mind that at that time I owned a gym and my kids have four boys. They were ages one through nine at the time. So my writing was kind of compressed to nap time. And when my amazing husband would come home and I would just thrust all four kids at him to give me some more time to write. And then the publication process took the remainder of that time. So about 14 months, just lots of time reviewing, editing, participating in the layout and cover design. Of course, I read and reread before I even submitted it for publication. I had a theological review done and had a beta group who read and offered some really valuable feedback to me. I could only imagine what was going through your head when you open up the mailbox and your first copy came in. You got to hold that book for the first time, Kim. What was that like? That was a a little bit surreal, to be honest. You know, like I said, I had been working on it for so long that when it finally arrived in the mail, it didn't really seem quite real. And I'd also really been holding the project close to my heart. I hadn't told very many people about it. One, because it's it's a very vulnerable topic and it's not often discussed outside of cultural beauty obsession. Mm. And in the book, I'm extremely candid with readers about my personal experiences. So I really had to be brave in sharing the news, but once I did, it was really wonderfully received, and it already seems to be bearing fruit and touching chords within countless women's hearts already. I'm sure you learned an awful lot along the way of publishing this book, Kim. So is there any advice now that you have to throw out there to the aspiring authors listening to us? I do. I do. You know, I would say that if you feel that prompt within your heart, 
right, then just heed that voice, heed God's voice. The most important thing for me is that I really started every day in my research and in my writing next to my desk on my knees in prayer, asking God what he wanted me to say. That was everything. That was the most important advice I could give to anybody. I know so many people are going to get a lot out of this book. I encourage my listeners to seek this one out for sure. Again, it's titled Chasing Beautiful, a Bible study on faith, fitness, and physical appearance. It's written by Kimberly Stork and published by Christian Faith Publishing. So you can find it anywhere that you shop for your books. Normally go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to find this. Kim, thank you so much for joining me tonight, telling me all about your work. I had a really nice time. I did, too. Thank you so much for having me. Readers will uncover the playful, divine artistry in each of us as God's uniquely created children. In the new book by Melissa Gassman, it's titled, Our Story, We Are Made for a Purpose. I get to talk all about this book right now. Melissa is with me at the show. Melissa, welcome. Thank you for being here with me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Can you tell me all about our story? We're made for a purpose. Sure. It's playful, truthful, and hopeful. It's a story about how God creates each one of us, that we are made to love and serve and forgive others, that we have moms and dads who care for us and family members who care for us, and that we also care for them. Also, that we're made boys and girls, and we're all unique. We have different wiggles and giggles and things that make each one of us special and loved and cared for. And it's just trying to introduce God to kids maybe that wouldn't have been introduced to them before, but to just show them that there is a purpose for them, that they are wanted, that they are created by God and loved by God. Would you say this is a book mainly for younger children or children of all ages? Oh, for sure. I think definitely for younger kids, young readers as well. But, you know, it's illustrated. It's got lots of colorful pictures. So it's simple and everything rhymes. So definitely (laughs) the younger readers and and early readers are the best ones for that. Melissa, what was the inspiration for you to write this? How did you get the idea? Well, I have a granddaughter and she's always struggled a little bit with reading until she finally figured out during school that she had dyslexia. So we spent a lot of time reading books together and a lot of books, sometimes there didn't seem to be a purpose for the book or any real meaning to it. So it wasn't that enjoyable to read. And so that was one of the things that I was wanting to do was to create a book that I would enjoy reading with my granddaughter and that it would share the values that I would love to share with her that I would want her to be encouraged by. And when it comes to writing and publishing and all of that, Melissa, are you new to this or have you done it before? No, totally new to this. This is my first one. And yeah, I've I've kind of wrote a couple of playful stories during COVID, like the very beginning of COVID and put pictures to them and shared those with her at that time and then kind of put it on a shelf. And then my husband heard an ad for a publishing company, and he really encouraged me to give it a try. So it was kind of our effort to discover what the process was and to do it together and to share it. So we we really enjoyed, like we we donated some of the books to the kids at church and seeing their joy, you know, when they got the book and seeing them looking at it and reading through it and just hearing feedback from the parents was really nice. How long of a process was this for you once you started off on it, clear up until it got published? (laughs) Well, so I guess 2020 is maybe when I started it. And then when we actually took it to the publisher, that was probably last spring, early in the spring. And so I think in May is when we officially got accepted and started on the process. So it came out just in time for Christmas. (laughs) And when you finally got the first copy in, you actually got to hold your book for that first time, Melissa. What kind of a moment was that like for you? Pretty amazing, actually. And I I remember just thinking that I couldn't wait to show it to her since she and I had seen it on a screen, you know, and talked about it before. And so sharing it with her and then, you know, also, of course, I look forward to having, we have six kids. So (laughs) looking forward to many more grandkids down the road and just thinking about the opportunity to share that with them. I'm sure other people will enjoy the book too, but that was really my main motivation was having something to share with my grandkids. Do you think you would do it again, Melissa? Do you see yourself writing more, publishing more? Yeah, I think that's the goal. I've already got two other books, one that I wrote during COVID and one that I've worked on since then. And yes, I think I would love to. And we'll see. And you're a published author now, Melissa. What's the most rewarding aspect of that for you? Well, I think being able to share it with other people. We had one book signing already and, you know, sitting on the floor with with the kids and, and having one of them work on reading it. And also I read it to some little bitties and just sharing it with others. I think that's, that to me is the most rewarding. And I know that that's not about dollars for me. It's just been more about the experience and sharing with others. 
Is writer's block ever a thing you got to deal with? Not really, because I'm not on the deadline, right? I'm just doing it on my own. <laughs> so no, not really. No, I, so if I get the mood, it's kind of like painting a piece of furniture. You know, when you get the mood to do it, you just sit down and start to work on it. I think so many children are going to love this book. Again, it's titled Our Story. We are made for a purpose. It's written by Melissa Gassman and is published by Covenant Books. So go everywhere that you go to pick up books like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to find this. Melissa, it's been wonderful speaking with you here tonight. Thanks for telling me all about your work and everything. It was great talking. Great talking with you, too, Corey. Hinduism and the Man on the Cross. Well, that's the next book written by Norman Law, and we're going to be talking all about it here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, Norman, is here with me. Norman, welcome back to the show. Thank you for being here again. Thank you. This is a really interesting topic, Hinduism and the Man on the Cross. Can you tell me all about the book? Hinduism, I don't know if people know, but there is 1,400 Hindu temples in the U.S. Oh, wow. And 120 Hindu temples in Texas alone. But people don't really know too much of what Hinduism is. And I got many Hindu friends who worked with me before. And I thought that the majority of them do not know their faith. They don't know why they practice such things, and they don't know where it came from. It's like worshipping in ignorance, and it is the same thing as many Buddhists and Hindus and Roman Catholics and many, many religions. So I decided to start researching on it, and I discovered many new things. The gods of Hinduism did not come from India. They come from the Middle East. Hmm. The first documented Hindu gods are written in Sanskrit in eastern Turkey. And the gods they worship are four gods, which are Indra, Agni, Shiva, and Natsaya. And they're all in eastern Turkey. And I begin to wonder how it goes from the Middle East down to India. Then I came to my mind one night that when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea and went into Canaan, there's 700,000 men. So when I add women and children, there's about 2 million of them. And they displace the people of Canaan. And there are about 97 to 90 different tribes that fled the country. In those days, you have a village, maybe a few thousand people. But when you see 2 million people coming, you shake on your boots. <laughs> <laughs> so they fled, except for some. Many were conquered, maybe have to flee. So they kind of go north because Turkey is very strong. They are the Matani and Hatani civilization. It is very strong. It's Persia and Babylon, Iraq. So they went south. And you can see evidence of idol worship in Mahandro Daro and Haripan, which is the Indus Valley northwest of India. So to me, then I checked the language. There is no developmental Sanskrit found in India. Therefore, the language could not have been begun in India. So since it started in Turkey, Eastern Turkey, under the Matani civilization, it must have come from that. Then I checked the first temple in India where you get group worship. The first temple was built in 4 AD. So that's very late for civilization because the Zuguran in Persia is about 2500 BC and India is at 4 AD. So it must have come from that area. So that's the first discovery of the Hinduism. Interesting. Norman, looking down the road, do you see yourself writing and publishing more along these lines? I'm now working on Quran controversies and contradictions, mm. and then I'm working on Sikhism. Sikhism is when you see in the, in the U.S. in public a man that wears a turban, most of them, or they wear a metal ring on their wrist. They are Sikhs. And the Sikhs is really influenced by most Islam, Christianity, and Hinduism. Fantastic. Well, now that you've been writing and publishing a lot, is there any advice that you could offer to the aspiring authors who are listening to us? I don't really, because it started out as a burden in my heart, and that's the way. There's a, a sudden compulsion to, to write. It doesn't leave me. And then when I'm finished, it's done. Then the, the next burden comes in my head. So I'm, I'm not a great author or anything like that, but I'm just writing on ideology and doctrines. If you're Norman, now that you're published, what's the most rewarding aspect for you of being a published author? I don't. I just found that I can talk to my Hindu friends, my Buddhist friends, my Muslim friends, and I truly, in a sense, know more than they do. And it makes interesting conversation and rewarding conversation that I can share Christ with them in a respectful way, mm. because I know what they believe. So when I ask them, they can answer. So 
it gives me a better perspective on what they believe. I know a lot of people are going to find out a lot more about this and are going to be blessed by this book. Again, it's titled Hinduism and the Man on the Cross. It's written by Norman Law, published by Christian Faith Publishing. So head to Amazon, head to Barnes & Noble, head to iTunes or down the street to your local bookshop, and you'll be able to pick this up. Well, Norman, I really appreciate you coming on the show and telling me about this book. I had a nice time talking with you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, readers are in for a lot of fun with this book that I'm looking at now. It's titled Kitty Likes Apples. It's written by Kelly West, and I get to find out more about this book. Kelly is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Kelly, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on your podcast today. The pleasure is all mine, Kelly. I'm really excited to learn about Kitty Likes Apples. Can you tell me about it? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, this book is for young readers. It's a really great book for those who are wanting to like find something new to read or something fun or a little bit interesting and full of imagination. So this book is basically um, about an actual cat that I had in my life named Kitty. She was named Kitty, and I was about eight years old when I had written the book. And I just decided, like, hmm, my cat's not always the friendliest. She was always kind of, like, stubborn and didn't like to do much. And we, she would, like, be around the house, and I would have to look for her. But I was like, what actually would make my cat happy? So <laughs> I said, why not an apple? I love it. Oh, when it comes to writing and publishing, Kelly, have you done this kind of thing before? No, I actually have not, but I've written books and I also have sequels to this book. But right now I'm just focusing on Kitty Likes Apples in particular because it's actually my one of my favorite books to have written that I've felt that I liked so far. So, yeah. How long of a process was this for you once you sat down, started writing clear up until it was published? The book up until now, since I've been like all the years, I decided to just wait to have the book published. I decided like, you know, why not just go ahead and publish the book? Like my family members, they commented that they really liked it. And I was like, well, you know, why not? And my husband, he liked the book. So I was like, why not have it, you know, sent to the world? Because other people might want to see it and enjoy it as well. And when that day came, Kelly, and you open up your mailbox and you get a box, you open up that box, and there it is, your first copy of Kitty Likes Apples. And you get to pick it up and actually hold this book. What was that like? It was a really neat and fun experience. I never thought that I would actually see my book in like the marketing company or anything like that or just publishing. So that was like almost like a dream come true. I'm sure you learned a lot along the way of publishing for the first time. Is there anything that you learned or picked up that you could throw out there as advice for the aspiring authors listening? Absolutely. I would say never rush to have your work published. Just do something that you want to do as far as like looking at the work that you've done. Like if you enjoy it and you feel like others might enjoy it, then go forward and take a step forward and take time to have the work done and research that this is something that others might enjoy. Yeah, good advice. And when it comes to a book like this, something that is often important is what's on the cover, the illustrations and all of that. Kelly, what kind of a process was that for you with this book? So I did all the illustrations and I did the writing. Hmm. It was a really fun process, you know, just kind of having like an imagination on what I think the actual artwork should look like to go with each page and each sequence of the story. So I kind of just built it together with the pictures in the story. So I kind of like combined it all and it just made it into a nice little fun, beautiful book. And when you think about the publishing end of things, there's just so many different things involved in that. Is there any part of that that you found particularly challenging? Yes, I also found it kind of challenging to know what to do about the work that I have. I also found it rewarding as well because I was able to like take a chance and have the book published. Like if people are like, you know, they might be like, oh, this is really different. I never heard of a cat liking to eat apples or anything like that's never happened before. So, yeah, I also found it challenging because you kind of don't know how, you know, everyone else might react like in the long run. But it's also rewarding knowing that it's out there. When you were writing this one or the subsequent ones, was writer's block ever an issue for you? No, I don't think so. It was just something that I felt like I had to like learn in the process because it's a part of being an author. That's just something you have to take time to learn as well. And when you think over everything, Kelly, what's the most rewarding aspect for you of being a published author now? After all these years, just being able to share something with the world. You talked about more books in this series. How many do you have planned out, or are you just kind of going as they come? 
I actually have three new books planned out that I would like to have published that I'm going to wait a little bit before I decide to like put them out there right now. So I want to focus mainly on Kitty Likes Apples, but I will say that there are new books coming in the future, most definitely. Fantastic. Well, I love this story in this book, and I know young readers are going to love it too. Again, the title is Kitty Likes Apples. It's written by Kelly West. It's published by Christian Faith Publishing, so go on over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to pick this one up. Kelly, thank you again for joining me in the show, telling me all about your work. It was really nice talking. It was really nice talking to you, too. Thank you so much. Third Time's the Charm. It's the new book by Michaela Moore. It's a gripping murder mystery. And I get to learn all about it today here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Michaela is here with me now. Michaela, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to learn about Third Time's the Charm. It's a heartfelt murder mystery. Can you tell me about this? I sure can. It starts off with Dominic Gallo, who is an art dealer and part-time high-end art thief. And this billionaire hires him to steal these two priceless amulets, Egyptian amulets. They're called charms, actually. And through this sort of bizarre set of events, he loses them. Then he finds out who might have them, a number of people who might have them. So he starts breaking into their homes, trying to find them and steal them back. And of course, the billionaire is not happy and threatening his life over all of this. Then one of the names on his list is Melinda Stark. Melinda Stark is a physical therapist there in town, so he decides to become a patient of hers and see if he can't just sort of surreptitiously figure out if she has the charm. Well, (laughs) come to find out, she happens to be dating a homicide detective, and she is involved in, has wormed her way in, I should say, into an investigation where a friend of her son's was murdered. So when those two people collide and those two things that they are after collide, that's where everything begins. I mean, what is a thief to do when a woman is dating a detective? So it goes on from there. Sounds exciting. Michaela, how'd you come up with the idea for this? Well, actually, the book was started years ago when I was 25 years old. I had really debilitating panic attacks to the end that I ended up in my house. I was agoraphobic. I didn't leave my home for like two years. And I started writing at that point, and I was never good at writing journals. They just depressed me more. So I started writing about women who were brave and courageous and could do all of these sort of wacky things that I always have in my head, (laughs) but could do them and could get out of their house, basically. So I sort of wrote myself out of my house, I guess you might say. The title actually came to me first, and I sort of wrote the book around the title. How long of a process was this for you once you started writing it clear up until it was published? (laughs) Probably years plus three months. (laughs) After I ended up getting out of my house, then I continued to write books. But I was writing mostly, at that time, newspaper articles. I had something Newsweek. And I wrote, but I never had sort of the guts to actually publish any book. And so it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I actually decided, I'm going to really try this. So I finished the book. And then, of course, it took time to find a publisher and all of that. So here we are a couple of years later. So a long time, but not really. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how to explain it. It was sort of short and long. And after all that time, after all that work, what was it like when you finally got to hold your book for the first time? You had that physical thing. You saw your name on the cover. What was that like? Oh, my gosh. I cradled it. I held it. (laughs) It was the most exciting moment. I mean, to see your words in print. It's different than in the newspaper, and I don't exactly, I couldn't tell you why that is. It's just different. Your words in the cover and your name, and you thought of that and you wrote that, and people are going to be reading that. It's just sort of all-encompassing. It's an emotional reaction, actually, I think. Do you think there'll be a follow-up to this one or more publishing for you in the future? Oh, absolutely. I already have two more written in the Heartfelt Murder Mystery series. The next one is Focus, Hocus Pocus. The next one is Eight Ball Corner Pocket. And the current one I'm working on in that same series is the Dyslexic Hitman. 
Oh, fantastic. Well, I think readers are going to love this book. Again, it's called Third Time's the Charm, A Heartfelt Murder Mystery. It's written by Michaela Moore, published by Newman Springs Publishing, and it's available everywhere. So get on over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to pick this up. Michaela, thanks again for being on the show here. Tell me all about your work. I had a good time talking with you tonight. Thank you so much, Corey. Newcomers to Canada will be able to unlock the secrets to financial success in the new book by Akinwala Thompson. It's titled The Pursuit of the Canadian Dream. And we're going to talk about this more here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, Akinwala, is here with me now. Akinwala, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you for having me, sir. Absolutely. Can you tell me all about what readers can find in Pursuit of the Canadian Dream? Well, Pursuit of the Canadian Dream is a book designed to teach the users how to navigate a developed financial system. So learning to know what to do in different circumstances. So whether it's how to build your credit, how to buy your first home, insurance, and all the different aspects of our society that people really take for granted. This is what the book teaches its readers. What sorts of readers were you speaking to here? Did you have a specific audience you're thinking about? Certainly. I think my audience really are new immigrants, youth, and basically anybody that needs to learn how to improve their financial life. Uh, Canada welcomes a lot of new immigrants every year. And it was just assumed that they'll be able to fit into the system. And without knowing the intricacies of it, you could really make uh, mistakes that could be damaging for a very long time. Can you tell me how you were inspired to write this, Akinwala? What gave you the idea? Back in 2008, during the subprime crisis, uh, I saw that a lot of people had to go into debt. You know, the banks were mm. canceling existing open lines of credit on used credit cards. And I just found that a lot of people were running helter skelter. That's when I first had the idea of writing the book. But I never really put it together at that time. I just jotted a few thoughts down. Uh, but over the years, I've come to think of what did I experience that was a barrier for me as an immigrant myself. And that's really what led me to sit down and actually put down the thoughts as to what somebody who is new to Canada or who is new to the system needs to know. Have you done anything like this before, or is this your first time? This is actually my first time. Well, I am a financial planner, and I teach money management classes in my community. So I like to educate people on the things they need to know normally. But this is my first book. That's fantastic. How long did this take you to write and then have published? Well, even though the idea was years ago, it really took two and a half years of sitting down and writing. So when COVID hit in 2020, I remember having a thought that, you know, we don't know if we're going to be sitting at home for three months or six months or longer than that. And I just thought, you know, what I think it'd be best to finally sit down and do I've always wanted to do, and that's finished the book that I that I began to write a few years ago. So I seriously started writing uh, around that time, and I finished it by the end of COVID period. And of course, we're talking about the audiobook edition. So what was it like for you when you actually heard your book as opposed to reading it like you were used to all that time? Uh, it, was, it was quite exhilarating. I think just hearing, it was very different. I, I, I have uh, so many kinds of emotions that I can't even begin to describe with words. Uh, I was quite excited just hearing it and seeing the process is very interesting for someone who has never done anything like that before. It was, uh, it was quite thrilling to do. Is there anything that you learned along the way that you would like to pass along as advice for the authors who are also starting out? I think the main thing is that there are no shortcuts. Mm. Right? The processes that you have to go through, if you have to write, you literally have to write every day, you know, set aside time every day and write, mm. and write and write to get the job done. And then once the job is done, you now have to find a publisher to get somebody to do the audio. I mean, some people will do the audio themselves. I engaged audiobooks, and they were able to help me along the way to get that done. So it's really a very interesting process, and I think that as long as you don't take shortcuts, you would end up with a good product. 
I think a lot of audiobook listeners are going to get an awful lot out of this book. Again, it's titled Pursuit of the Canadian Dream. It's written by Akinwala Thompson and is published by the Audiobook Network. So go everywhere that you pick up your audiobooks, you'll be able to find this, like on Audible, iTunes, or Amazon. Akinwala, thank you again for joining me and telling me all about Pursuit of the Canadian Dream. I had a nice time talking with you tonight. Thank you very much. I'm holding a book that's full of poetic inspiration that uplifts and encourages believers from diverse backgrounds. The book is titled Seasons of Scripture, Poems, and Praises. This is written by Wanda Chronic Coates, and I get to talk all about this now. Wanda is with me now. Wanda, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Can you tell me all about Seasons of Scripture, Poems, and Praises? Yes. About three years ago, the Lord gave me, well, he put in my heart to begin a magnet ministry where I would infuse scripture along with some of the poems that I've written and send it out to fellow believers to encourage them. And according to Isaiah 50 verse 4, we are to know a word to sustain the weary. And that's my goal is Mm -hmm. to reach out to fellow believers and give them some encouragement and some hope along the way. And then just recently, I guess probably about six months ago, The Lord laid on my heart to put all my writings into a book so I could reach a broader audience. And so along with my sister's encouragement and the Lord's nudging, this is where I'm at now. Wanda, have you ever done anything like this before? Have you ever written or been published? No, I've never been published, but I've been writing all my life. When I was a young child, I had a speech impediment, a stuttering, where I would talk too fast. And of course, I would start stuttering over my words. And so that led me to put my thoughts into writing. Hmm. And so I've been really writing all my life. Once you got started on this one, uh, how long did it take you clear up until it got published? Well, the poems were written probably over a period of three years. There are different seasons, different holidays, different happenings in the world. And so I guess probably about three years compiling everything together. When it came to the publishing end of things, what did you find the most challenging about that for you? Probably waiting, you know, waiting to make sure that someone would accept my manuscript, waiting to to see how long it's going to be published, making the edits and corrections and this and that. But it really was pretty easy. It wasn't a hard process at all. Hmm. Then after all that work and all that waiting, when you finally got your first copy in and you got to hold the physical copy for the first time, Wanda, what kind of a moment was that like for you? It was very humbling. Also, you know, pretty exciting. Because a lot of work had had gone into this book, not only, of course, on my end, but on the publisher's end as well. And so it was pretty exciting, but, but, you know, once again, humbling as well. Do you think you would do it again? Do you see yourself writing and publishing more in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got tons and tons of poems, and I would like to one day put those together into a book. And now, Wanda, for you, you're a published author. What's the most rewarding aspect of it for you? Probably the most rewarding aspect would be to know that I am fulfilling a gift that the Lord gave me, hmm. and I'm reaching fellow believers, and I'm encouraging fellow believers. I've heard from so many people who have told me how much my poems have touched them, and so that's just like encouragement to me for me to keep doing what I'm doing. So many people listening to us right now are authors who are just starting out. They're aspiring. So, Wanda, is there anything you might have learned along the way that you could offer them as advice? Yes, I would say to journal, you know, write down your thoughts, just anything that's going on in your life. And before you know it, you will have enough to to put into book form and just to, you know, keep going, keep writing. I have a notepad that I keep next to my bed because if I'm inspired, I'll just, you know, get up and just, you know, jot down the thoughts that are in my head. And so just always keep a notepad close by to write down your thoughts. Wanda, who do you have around you in your life who can maybe inspire or encourage or uplift you? Well, of course, my family, they're very excited about this whole process, and and they always offer encouragement. My husband, a lot of times I use him as a sounding board. I said, you know, how does this sound? You know, do you think I need to make some corrections? And of course, I have my daughter. She's she's really good at editing the things that I write. So just my family overall. Was writer's block ever a thing you had to deal with? Oh, sure. Sometimes, you know, I'll start writing and, and I'll just write and write and write. And then, like you say, I have a writer's block. But what I do, I just get up and just go about my business doing other things and I'll come back. And once I come back, then I can start back again. Sometimes you just have to leave the process. 
Well, I know that believers across the board are going to get so much encouragement out of this book. Again, it's titled Seasons of Scripture, Poems, and Praises. It's written by Wanda Chronic Coates, and it's published by Covenant Books. So go to Amazon, go to Barnes & Noble, go to iTunes, traditional brick-and-mortar stores, wherever you go to pick up your books, you'll be able to find this. Wanda, thanks again for joining me here and telling me about your work. I had a nice time talking with you. Thank you. I enjoyed talking to you as well. I'm looking at a book right now that's an easy-to-read guide on using acupuncture points to relieve pain and enhance performance, written by an expert in the field. That expert is Dr. Michael Mahan, and the book is titled Soft Tissue Answers for the Layman. I get to find out all about this. Michael is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Michael, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. The pleasure's mine. Can you tell me what readers will find in Soft Tissue Answers for the Layman? They'll find ways to relieve more common pains, headaches, low back pains, menstrual pains, all kinds of things. They'll also see how to enhance athletic performance. I take it this is a very general, broad audience that you are speaking to here. Yes, sir. I've retired after 40-odd years of practice, and I found that this was a good answer for a lot of people. Was there any specific inspiration that made you think, hey, i got to sit down and get started on this book. People need this. There are a number of cases that come to mind that make me want to share this because people can get some relief, and it doesn't require any kind of drugs or pain in any way. When it comes to writing and being published, have you ever done this before, or is this your first time? This is my first time. Well, congratulations. How long did this take you once you sat down and started it, clear until it got published? Probably two years. And after that time and all the work that you put into it, what was it like when you finally got that first physical copy in? It was very exciting. When I opened the book and saw the Library of Congress information and ISBN numbers, it made me feel like I'd legitimately accomplished something there with the book. And now that you are a published author, Michael, what's the most rewarding aspect of that for you? Knowing that I've shared some of my knowledge with anybody that can read and use the knowledge and that it's something that people in all walks of life and every age group can use. When it came to the publishing end of things, was there any aspect of that, Michael, that you found particularly challenging? Not once I found Covenant Publishing. I submitted some inquiries about being published to other folks, and it was turned down or ignored, but I was happy with the way that the folks at Publishing House handled this. Looking ahead of you, Michael, do you see yourself writing and publishing more? Yes, I've got an expanded version of this that's written for the healthcare professional that I'm working on. And now that you've been through the writing and publishing thing here for the first time, I'm sure you learned a lot. So do you have any advice now that you'd like to offer for the aspiring authors out there? Well, I would say just keep on to you find someone that you're comfortable with as far as a publisher. Now, you spend so much time writing, getting those words just right, but you might not think right away about what it's going to look like, what's going to go on the cover. Michael, what kind of a process was that for you? Was that a challenge to figure that out? Well, initially I had another cover in mind, but I got to thinking about what we were trying to convey here, and so I gave them my idea of what I wanted, and they came up with a very good cover, I thought. Michael, who inspires you in your life or keeps you encouraged and uplifted, especially when it comes to things like this? I'm a Christian, and I rely a lot on prayer. And when I first started in practice back in 1977, I wanted to be able to use some information that was a little bit new and a little bit sketchy at the time. So I sat down, and the Bible promises us wisdom if we'll ask for it. And so I did, and I was able to figure out how to go from using needles in acupuncture to using the magnets where there's no discomfort or or reason to fear puncturing the skin or or people having a fear of needles. And it was just as effective. Hmm. I know a lot of people are going to find a lot of answers in this book. Again, it's titled Soft Tissue Answers for the Layman. It's written by Dr. Michael Mahan, D.C., and published by Covenant Books. So, of course, you can find it everywhere. Go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to pick up this book. Well, Michael, thank you for joining me tonight and telling me about your work. I had a really good time talking with you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable. 
where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.